Welcome to the flipped lesson for psychoanalytic reading of The Great Gatsby. I am going to show you one interpretation or one psychoanalytic reading. You may have a different psychoanalytic reading and that is perfectly valid because there are many different ways to do this kind of reading or to apply this kind of reading. This is the version I will be of the text I will be using to give my page numbers to you. Any Penguin edition will have the same page numbers. This is the standard copyright notice for all my flipped lessons. Please note you may not share this video nor the link with anyone. So, what is a psychoanalytic reading? Well, I would like you to imagine the text as a patient and you, the reader, as a doctor. When the patient presents with signs or symptoms of an illness, you ask that patient questions to find out what the underlying illness or condition is. In the same way, a psychoanalytic reading is a reading which treats a text like a patient and examines it for its latent or hidden issues and motivations. What is not visible on the surface? What are the reasons behind what we read, see and hear? What is hidden in our unconscious? What do we learn about the author's unconscious desires and broader cultural influences? At this point, I would like to remind you that any reading you apply to any text must be accompanied by the vocabulary and the meta-language of this reading. So in a psychoanalytic reading, I would like you to use words such as repression or unconscious or psyche or latent. And you cannot, for example, apply a feminist reading without using the words oppression or patriarchy. So you must learn to use the vocabulary of any reading that you apply. There are many different ways that we can psychoanalyze. We tend to look for when people are anxiety or demonstrating self-destructive behaviour. Now, self-destructive behaviour does not necessarily mean self-harm, but a person might be prone to saying or doing things which perhaps land them in trouble or things that reveal a lot of things about them. Anxiety is very common, so let's have a look at some common reasons for anxiety. So we have a fear of intimacy and this is the one that I'm going to be examining today. The fear of intimacy is that chronic and overwhelming feeling that any emotional closeness with a person will hurt us or destroy us and the only way we can remain emotionally safe is by maintaining a distance from other people at all times. And so a fear of intimacy can also be used as a defense mechanism and people feel more vulnerable if they open themselves, open themselves up emotionally to another person and therefore it is easier to not let ourselves become emotionally involved with anyone at all. The next one we're going to look at is the fear of abandonment. This is the belief that our friends or our family or our loved ones are going to either desert us, which is physical abandonment, or don't really care about us, which is emotional abandonment. And as you can imagine, this can also create considerable anxiety in a person. Then there is a fear of betrayal. This is the feeling that our near and dear ones cannot be trusted. For example, our family cannot be trusted not to lie to us. Our friends may be laughing behind our backs or our colleagues may be t telling us untruths and lies. And there's this fear that we are going to be betrayed by them. There's a little bit of paranoia there. Another reason for anxiety is low self-esteem. This is the belief that we are less worthy than other people. And because of this, we don't deserve their attention, their love, or any of the other rewards that life has to offer. Indeed, we often believe that we deserve to be punished by life in some way. Then we have an insecure or unstable sense of self. And there's a lack of personal identity here. And it makes us vulnerable to the influence of other people. It makes us very impressionable. 
For example, in the F Julia Roberts and Richard Gere's film The Runaway Bride, we have the, the protagonist who is engaged a number of times but cannot seem to m make it past the altar. She never gets married. And her choices in how she likes her eggs change with every fiancé that she has. So it's a classic psychoanalysis case where we have not just an insecure or unstable sense of self, but also a fear of commitment, a fear of emotional closeness. Then we have another one which you are familiar with, the Oedipal fixation or the Oedipal complex. And this is when a person has a dysfunctional bond with a parent of the opposite sex that we don't grow out of in adulthood. And so this uh, doesn't help us develop mature relationships with our peers or with romantic partners. Now, these are some of the reasons for anxiety or self-destructive behavior. And to some extent, we all have some of these. You might have noticed some of these in yourself. You might have noticed some of these in people around you. But when they, we see them in a text, we analyze the text for the character who's displaying these things or perhaps for the author's unconscious coming through in the text that is written. This cartoon is a classic representation of psychoanalysis. When we hope that we won't trip down the stairs or fall down the stairs, and we're so in fear of doing that and trying to make sure we don't do that, that we actually do trip and fall down the stairs. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, for example, in Professor Trelawney's class, she predicts that Neville will break her favourite teacup. And Neville is so caught up in trying to make sure he does not break that teacup that he actually does break the teacup. These are some questions to ask literary texts. I am not going to read them, but you are welcome to pause this video here and read them yourself. So, let's get to The Great Gatsby now. We have here a romance between Daisy and Gatsby, and that is the plot, the main plot of the text. But the romance between these two characters actually mirrors and reflects other romances, perhaps less appealing ones, such as the one of Tom and Daisy, or perhaps Tom and Myrtle, perhaps Myrtle and George, and Nick and Jordan. And we are going to look at all of these today. So we see a pattern of psychological behaviour, which is grounded in the character's fear of intimacy. And we're going to go through all these characters and see their fear of intimacy. Now, this fear of intimacy is the unconscious conviction that any emotional ties we have to another human being will result in our being emotionally devastated and emotionally hurt. And so this persistently appears in the novel and really all this fear of intimacy displayed by the characters and the relationships really causes The Great Gatsby to effectively become a drama of dysfunctional love. So let's begin with Tom. Tom's continuing extramarital affairs are something we are aware of and which Jordan becomes aware of only three months after Tom and Daisy are married. And in fact, when we meet Tom, he is also having an affair. But by dividing his time between two women, Tom is protected from having any real intimacy with either of them. Tom's relationships with women, even his wife, De reveal his desire for having his ego satisfied, for ego gratification, and not any need for personal intimacy. So Tom does not really want to get close to the women he's with. He, they are there to satisfy his ego. Now how? Well, Daisy represents social superiority for Tom. And as we find out, she is not the kind of woman who can be acquired by a Mr. Nobody from nowhere. So she represents class and status for Tom. On the other hand, Tom's possession of Myrtle satisfies his ego in a different way. Nick describes Myrtle as sensuous, smouldering, and a woman with an immediately perceptible vitality. 
Now this reinforces Tom's sense of his own masculine power. And these quotes are from page 128 and Daisy is from 123. And so Tom brings Myrtle to fashionable restaurants where they can be seen by other people. And that's also why he introduces Myrtle to Nick so soon after the initial dinner in chapter one, because these, she is a way that he can seem more like a man, appear more macho. Now, Daisy is accustomed to a husband and she knows that he will constantly be interested in other women. It is not a surprise for her. She is used to it. And so in chapter six at Gatsby's party, when Tom tells Daisy he wants to eat dinner with a group of friends at Gatsby's party, she actually offers him her little gold pencil in case he wants to take down any addresses and later on tells Nick that the girl was common but pretty. And these are on a page 102. So they are both accustomed to Nick's, her, sorry, Tom having affairs, but she is not so emotionally close to him that she actually minds. Let's have a look at Daisy, because Daisy, you might think, gets upset and does have emotional closeness to Tom, because she gets upset with Tom's affair with Myrtle, and that appears to indicate a need for emotional closeness. But Daisy's a fear of intimacy is just as intense as Tom's. Now, let's have a look at jo Jordan's description of Daisy after her honeymoon. However, the history of their relationship indicates otherwise because Jordan tells Nick that Daisy was madly in love with Tom after the honeymoon. But yet, it is obvious that Daisy did not love Tom when they married. For one thing, she tried to call off the wedding the evening before and she appears to have married Tom to keep her mind off Gatsby. However, three months later, after the honeymoon on page 75, she seems obsessively fond of him, even though she knows that he is not being faithful to her. Now, psychoanalytically, a woman who falls in love with a man who fears intimacy probably fears intimacy herself, as nothing can make her feel safer than a man who has no desire for it. So she feels safe with Tom because she feels she doesn't need to open up to Tom and become emotionally close to Tom. And therefore she is able to relax and have that marriage and be fond of him without, reveal, without becoming emotionally close to him. So when Daisy realizes that Tom's interest does not focus solely on her, she is able to love him because he poses no threat to her protective shell, to the wall she's built around her emotions. Even if Tom could break through the wall, he wouldn't really want to. So Daisy's attitude towards Tom changes. This is very similar to a person who has been neglected or abused by her parents, as she will unconsciously choose a partner to fulfill these psychological needs. However, ironically, she will probably find someone who shares the same qualities as her parents. And so the person's self-esteem will suffer and she will probably feel she doesn't deserve to have her needs met. So her unconscious needs remain repressed and she is unable to confront them and deal with them. And you might have seen them in this in film and TV series where the more we want something, the more we are unable to give it and receive it. And so, Tom and Daisy's fear of intimacy is related to the low self-esteem. And we're talking about both of them. Because if Tom were emotionally secure, he would not try to impress and intimidate people with his money and power, and even with his reference to the dominant race in chapter one. Even Tom's mistresses are from the lower class, which represents his need to boost his insecure psyche and ego through wielding power over other people. Daisy's low self-esteem and fear of intimacy are obvious in her relationship with Tom. Because by falling in love with a man who is openly unfaithful to her suggests an unconscious belief 
that she does not fear, does, she does not deserve any better. And Daisy's own insecurity, like Tom's, also requires the ego reinforcement which is obtained by impressing others, and which is why she adopts her affectations in her eyes flashing, the raising and lowering of her voice, etc. We see this when Daisy has other people around her and we see her adopt these affectations and these affectations are signs of her insecurity. Tom and Daisy's relationships with other people also reveal their fear of intimacy. Let's look at their daughter, Pammy. Daisy's call to her daughter, Pammy, on page 111, blessed precious and come to your own mother that loves you, really seems to be more about showing off and dramatic posing than any real maternal love and bond. We also see that neither Tom nor Daisy form close ties with Nick or Jordan, and it is also interesting that they don't stay in any one place for any length of time because they will not this way, they will not become close to people. So they move away from their place before they really become close to anyone. Let's have a look at Tom and Myrtle. Now, Tom does not want to be emotionally close to Myrtle either. She is only a way to avoid being close to his wife Daisy and his treatment of her does not indicate in any way any emotional attachment. Tom calls for Myrtle when it suits him. He lies to her when he says that Daisy has a religious opposition to a divorce and he casually breaks her nose with a short, deft movement when she becomes inconvenient, inconveniently demanding, and this is on page 39. When Myrtle dies and Tom says he cried like a baby at the apartment, well, this suggests self-indulgence and self-pity and not any love for Myrtle. For Myrtle, Tom represents an economic escape or an escape from George Wilson's garage and through Tom, Myrtle wants to acquire a position in a world of a higher status where she can become someone else and display her impressive hauteur and where her laughter, her gestures, her assertions become more violently affected moment by moment. And this is on page 33. However, Myrtle's other relationships also suggest that she wants to avoid intimacy. We know that Myrtle did not marry George for love and that she believed mistakenly that he was from a higher class with good breeding. George also appears to depend completely and emotionally on Myrtle, and just like his belief that the Eckelberg eyes are the eyes of God, this suggests some kind of a psychological disorientation rather than any emotional closeness. And so, with a man so disoriented or lost in space, Myrtle does not need to worry about becoming too close to him. And when we see Myrtle's artificial behaviour with her own sister and the McKees, who appear to be her only friends, we, we surmise that these are simply occasions or opportunities for her to display her so-called superior status and wealth, and not for any real close intimacy with any of them. Then we have Nick and Jordan. Now Nick is first attracted to Jordan because of a complete self-containment, self-control and the emotional distance that she projects. He approves of her complete self-sufficiency on page 14 and her emotional aloofness appeals to him and attracts him. And Nick uses words in chapter 1 such as insolent, impersonal, cool and contemptuous to what he considers as the pleasing expression on Jordan's face. He remains interested in Jordan as long as she appears to belong to a faraway world where she goes to resorts such as the ones at Asheville and Hot Springs and Palm Beach. These are places which are untouched by emotions and you can find this on page 23. However, when, when Re Nick returns with Jordan after Myrtle's death, he hastily leaves her at, at Tom's house and he avoids her. He ends their relationship in a very distant manner and suppresses the memory of breaking up with her on the telephone the day after. And he says on the page 148, I don't know which of us hung up with a sharp click. So he avoids the conversation, he avoids any emotional entanglement 
and he has repressed the memory and avoided the memory of who it was who actually hung up in the first place. On a page 168, even when they meet to discuss what has happened, Nick admits he talked over and around the history, which again suggests that he avoided talking about painful issues. Nick's fear of intimacy is also suggested by his previous two romances. One was a tangle back home, which he wants to get himself out of, on page 59, and this indicates the relationship was more serious than he cares to acknowledge. So what do we learn about Nick? That when a relationship becomes serious, Nick starts avoiding the woman. Jordan's choice of career and friends also allow her to remain emotionally detached and insulated. Golf, for example, earn, enables her to turn her broad, haughty face to the world, such as at page 58, and even her friends, the Buchanans, prefer the world of social image to any genuine emotional closeness, so Jordan does not have to worry about becoming close with anyone. And, therefore, in choosing men like Nick, Jordan ensures that she is completely safe from emotional ties. Then we come to Gatsby and Daisy. Now, although Gatsby and Daisy's affair can appear to provide a counterpoint to the Buchanan's marriage of psychological convenience and other relationships as well, their romance has similarities as well. Daisy does not want intimacy with Gatsby either. And we know this because her early relationship with Gatsby would not have happened if she had known that he belonged to a lower class. And as Daisy says, rich girls don't marry poor boys. So when Tom tells Daisy of Gatsby's social origin when they're in the hotel on the page 128, she immediately withdraws and draws further and further into herself. And of course, the Buchanan's leave the next day. So she's not interested in Gatsby if he's poor. Gatsby, just like Myrtle, is a psychological pawn. Daisy uses Gatsby as a buffer when Myrtle begins calling Tom at home, because we notice Daisy getting upset in chapter one, not because Tom is having an affair, but because Myrtle has called Tom at home. So Gatsby then becomes a buffer or a welcome distraction for Daisy. And so Daisy's affair with Gatsby becomes a psychological defense and reveals the importance of marriage to her. If her marriage were not a powerful force in her, in her life, then she would not have to defend against it. So yes, her marriage is important, but she will not become emotionally close to anyone. And it is interesting that given that Gatsby and Myrtle are both psychological to tokens in the Buchanan's marriage, it is very symbolic that Tom and Daisy, in effect, kill each other's lovers. For example, Tom is the person who tells George Wilson whose car it is and where Gatsby lives, indirectly killing him. And of course, Daisy kills Myrtle, but lets Gatsby takes the blame. And this strengthens the notion that he has merely been a buffer for her. And there has been no relationship or any close intimacy. Then we have Gatsby himself. Gatsby believes that Daisy is his ultimate goal. But actually, she is the key to the goal and not the goal itself. And we know this because long before he knew Gatsby, sorry, long before Gatsby knew Daisy, Gatsby knew he wanted to be wealthy and he wanted to belong to a higher class. It is also evident that he suffered some kind of psychological trauma with his parents, enough at least to make him reject his relationship with them. As Mr. Gat says on page 165, he told me I ate like a hog once and I beat him for it. And on page 95, Nick, Nick says, his imagination had never really accepted them as his parents at all. Gatsby's claim that his family all died and he came into a good deal of money becomes in this context a metaphor for his desire to psychologically kill the parents whose wounding influence still inhabits his own psyche. 
and paradoxically at the same time receive from those parents the psychological nourishment or the money that they had never given him. And you can find this quote on page 64. It's like if I were to constantly tell you my parents are dead, my parents are dead, and yet you found out they were actually alive, it would symbolise perhaps a latent or hidden desire for me to actually kill them. So through Daisy, Gatsby can imagine what it feels to be, what it feels like to be a part of her world. And on page 142, we see how what it would be like to be in a world gleaming like silver, safe and proud above the hot struggles of the poor. And this is on page 142. So Daisy, for Gatsby, is a symbol for the emotional insulation he unconsciously wants from himself and from James Gats and his past. And just like Tom and Daisy, the best way to achieve emotional insulation or distance from oneself is to avoid any closeness with anyone else. Gatsby idealises Daisy as the perfect woman who can do no wrong and whom time cannot change. And this also indicates that he avoids intimacy and emotional closeness because it is impossible to be intimate with an ideal. We substitute the real for an ideal and how can we be close to them? It is also interesting that Gatsby's obsession with Daisy over the years has also protected him from closeness with other women. He does feel emotions though, and Daisy too, but what they feel for each other is merely a way of avoiding feeling the effects of something else, something that is so profoundly disturbing that they want to keep repressed, whether it be Gatsby's unhappy youth or Daisy's dysfunctional marriage or the fear of intimacy that both characters share. And so we find in The Great Gatsby, the romantic love becomes the stage on which all the unresolved psychological conflicts are dramatised. And this repetitive, destructive behaviour suggests unresolved psychological conflict and the return of the repressed, because we repress the psychological wounds and therefore we are condemned to repeatedly do the same thing, to incur them. Gatsby's very lonely pursuit of Daisy replays the loneliness of his youth and he seems to be as much of an outsider in his own mansion that he bought to impress Daisy as he must have felt in the home of his parents and at Gatsby's parties. We never see him mingling, we never see him dancing or drinking, he's always on his own. Gatsby felt abandoned by his parents but more so by Daisy twice, first when she married Tom and second when she, he loses her on the night of Myrtle's death. And so we can see that the novel shows us how these romantic relationships can help us, enable us to repress our psychological wounds. And in this way, we can examine the great Gatsby for the fear of closeness and the anxiety and the result of this fear of intimacy that is produced in these characters. And so, we end our lesson on the psychoanalysis of The Great Gatsby. It has been a rather long lesson. However, I hope you have taken something from this. But please remember, this is not a complete psychoanalytic reading. It is just one way to approach it.